G'day everyone, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Continuing on some post-draft content, and today we're going to talk about a topical subject within the AFL right now. And I'll say as well, this was requested by a lot of people in the comments over the last few weeks on uh, the overall situation right now with the academies that exist within the AFL system and how that impacts the AFL draft. Uh, now, I will say, first of all, there is a great video on this topic by the channel Footy A to Z. So if you haven't checked that out, by all means do so. If you're the sort of person who enjoys true footy content, Footy A to Z uh, will absolutely be your cup of tea. So go check out that channel in general uh, and do yourself a favor. So that video does a really good job of um, outlining you know, how the academies work and their impact on the draft. And today I'm gonna give you my own thoughts as well. So to start off with, I guess, we'll give you a brief overview of um, exactly what the academies are and why they exist. Before I get into it though, uh, I will shout out you guys for giving me the best week this YouTube channel has ever seen in terms of numbers and stats. It's been absolutely phenomenal. So thank you very much. Um, in my analytics, is do it does say that 28,000 different people watched a video on the True Footy YouTube channel this last week which is outstanding. So thank you and welcome to all those who are new. As an aside though, obviously I don't have 28,000 subscribers. So if you are someone who is watching the content uh, or has just discovered me, I would appreciate if you uh, consider subscribing because I'm trying to hit 25K by the start of the new year. But anyway, let's get into this video. So we're gonna cover what the academies are, their intended objectives, the outcomes that that has been a res as a result of the academy system, whether they're fair and what we can potentially do about it to make it more fair in the future. So it's important to distinguish two different types of academies that exist within the AFL system. You've got the Next Generation Academies, which pertain to 14 clubs outside of Queensland and New South Wales. And then you've got the Northern Academies and they have different rules applying to both of them. Essentially what these academies are is it's like academies set up by those individual clubs to develop talent. Now, who goes into these academies? Well, there's different criteria for the two different types of academies. Uh, for the Next Generation Academy Talents, which is outside of Queensland and New South Wales, the intention of them is to develop the game uh, outside of you know naturally Australian communities. So essentially, some criteria I found online was that if you are born in Africa or Asia or have a parent who was, or if you're indigenous and live within a particular geographical area, you can join that club's next generation academy. As for Queensland and New South Wales, there's no stipulation around being indigenous or from uh, an African or Asian country. If you're within a certain uh, geographical area, you will be aligned to one of those clubs in those two states. So the AFL set these up with two main objectives, you'd have to say. First of all, it's to attract the best talent on, a, on offer to you know strengthen the overall talent pool, improve the level of our game, and particularly uh, to not lose these talents to competing sports. You know, obviously there's rugby that exists um, in, well, in all states, but in particular, New South Wales and Queensland. And then of course, soccer as well is a growing sport within Australia. And also to develop football within these communities. It's not always about getting, you know, potentially high draft picks. It's about engaging with the community, getting kids playing footy, and which will therefore also improve the overall interest in the game, I suppose. So the, uh, the talk around the academy system in particular has sort of exploded this year, but we'll take a little overview and have a look at the Northern Academies in particular. Over the last eight years or so, I found a list of high draft picks that actually came out of both the Queensland and the New South Wales Academies, uh, which obviously includes four different clubs. So as you can see from this list here, uh, it goes back to Isaac Heaney in 2014 when Melbourne bid on him at pick three. And under those rules, Sydney were allowed to match with whatever the next pick was, which was pick 18. The rules were then amended the following year. And uh, when Callum Mills was bid on again by Melbourne, I believe, at pick three, Sydney had to simply match it using uh, you know, accumulated points from later draft picks. So the system changed from just simply matching it with their first rounder to making Sydney have to do the legwork to accumulate enough points to match a bid at pick three. So on this list, as you can see, uh, it includes a variety of, of players uh, across all four different academies. And some of them turned out to be guns, some of them didn't, and some of them ended up at different clubs anyway. But the reason I've highlighted this particular list is because this is showing the interference with the first round of uh, the last eight drafts. As you can see there in 2015, we had three picks. Uh, 2016, we had another four, all in the first round come from the academy system. Now you may notice as well, I didn't include all of the guns that have come through the academy system. There's a few notable absentees on that list. Jack Steele in 2014 was taken at pick 24 by GWS or matched at pick 24 and has become a gun since. Harris Andrews was matched at pick 61 in 2014 and Errol Golden as well. Uh, 
uh, was matched at pick 32 in 2020. So the reason I didn't include those because in this analysis, we're, we're talking about how much the Northern Academies potentially interfere with the top end of drafts, which is really the crux of the argument here. So the fact that three of them became guns, uh, but slipped into the 30s or 20s or even 60s in the case of Harris Andrews, I didn't think that was super relevant. But as you can see, we're getting more and more Queensland and New South Wales talent into the top end of these drafts. The reason being clubs are incentivized to develop their own talent, particularly in those states. And uh, naturally, the more money that's invested, the better the programs, the more talent that spits out. So one of the first like learnings that comes from that list is that um, the Northern Academies are obviously intended to grow the game in those rugby states. And when you also consider Gold Coast and Brisbane at one point and GWS certainly had retention issues. It makes sense for the AFL to want more talents coming out of Queensland and New South Wales so that the teams in those states don't have a disadvantage of having primarily Victorian or West Australian or South Australian kids on their lists and therefore they can improve their retention rates. Now, on the one hand, you know, it kind of makes sense. You know, Brisbane were struggling for a little while there, particularly when they picked up Harris Andrews. They were not in a good way as a football club. And Gold Coast have really never got um, off the ground and running. And GWS as well. They have been good at times, but they've also lost a lot of players to interstate clubs, particularly Victoria, over the stretch. So the weird one there is Sydney. They're kind of the outlier. They've been historically really strong club over the AFL decade and uh, you know won premierships, played in grand finals, and arguably they're the team that's benefited most from Northern Academy talents when they've got some serious guns in their best 22 in Mills, Heaney, Goulden if you want to include him, uh, Braden Campbell more recently. Nick Blakey is another absolute gun of the competition. So you can see that whether intentionally or not, uh, this has resulted in some really good windfalls for Sid the City Swans in particular. So that's the Northern Academies and the Next Generation Academies uh, was spat out a couple of years later. And the idea is that these clubs outside of these Northern states have the opportunity to develop their own uh, talents in more regional areas potentially, particularly if they're um, of a particular ethnicity. So the idea being growing the game out outside of uh, the traditional footballing families and potentially in more regional areas as well. So 14 other clubs now have an academy. And here's a list by comparison of some really notable next generation academy talents. So back in 2018, we had Tyron Thomas uh, taken a pick nine. Um, or matched at pick nine rather, Isaac Quainall in the same draft went at pick 13 with the bid match from GWS by Collingwood. In 2019, Liam Henry joined Fremantle as a match bid at pick nine. Lockie Jones at pick 16 in 2020 and also, of course, the number one overall pick in Jamara Yugel Hagen in 2020. So that was kind of the turning point where there was a rule change with respect to next generation academy talents where clubs were no longer able to match a bid inside the top 20 of a draft for their own next generation academy talents talents, which is kind of controversial in itself. But I suppose you could make the argument, to what extent is the Western Bulldogs really responsible for, say, a Jamara Yugel Hagen for developing him into a number one talent? That, to be honest, as outsiders, we can't really speculate on, but there's a good chance he may have become a gun football either way. And so the Bulldogs being rewarded with that is a bit of an absurd result. But here's the thing, when the rule changed, it's so that no club could match a bid inside top 20, and that has now become top 40 one year after that, that same restriction does not apply to the Northern Academies. As we saw the Gold Coast Suns here matched four players in their academy inside the first round of the 2023 draft, including pick three, Jed Walter, and then Ethan Reid at pick nine. So two top 10 picks. Now the argument for the Northern Academies having it a little bit better, or the Northern clubs I should say, is that Northern clubs will argue that it's harder to attract and retain talent in those Queensland states, which I suppose historically has been true. There's also the fact, as I learned in the footy A to Z uh, video, which is a great watch, that the Northern clubs have the least percentage of local talent on their list compared to any other club. So while that is probably true, I think if you look at the two strong sides out of the Northern States, or the two strongest sides, I would say, in Sydney and the Brisbane Lions, I suppose you could say GWS are strong too. But Sydney and the Brisbane Lions, at the moment, have done a great job of attracting talent and also retaining them. So in the, obviously in the mid 20 teens, the Brisbane Lions had that go home five, you know, Polek, Elliot Yo, guys like that all left the club, Rockliffe not long after, it was a little bit dire. But since then they've attracted a lot of non Queensland based talents to come and play for them, including guys like Lockie Neal and Joe Danaher. Equally, the Sydney Swans have done a really good job of attracting non-New South Wales-based players uh, previously to their club, including one of the biggest signings ever 
in Lance Franklin. And historically, other than a few exceptions, they don't really lose too many players either. By contrast, you will have to admit though, the Gold Coast Suns and GWS have had pretty disastrous results when it comes to retention. So we're getting this weird kind of outcome here where the two expansion sides who are arguably need the most help are not really benefiting that much from the system. When you consider as well, there's been academy players from GWS that didn't even stay at the club. Jacob Hopper, uh, I think Matthew Kennedy was one as well. Will Setterfield, arguably though, none of them really turned out to a high standard. Matthew Kennedy more so at Carlton. But the desired outcome there wasn't really achieved. Whereas Sydney obviously have uh, benefited quite a lot. And the Brisbane Lions obviously got Harris Andrews out of it. But, you know, fast forward to, you know, what is happening right now. And uh, at the moment, at this point in time, when you have a draft where four kids go in this first round to the uh, Gold Coast Academy, two of them inside the top 10, one of them inside the top three. And we have this simultaneous rule where outside clubs who don't have a Northern Academy, they have a Next Generation Academy, they can't match bids for their own players inside the top 40. And we saw four players that were part of Next Generation Academy talents that were missed by their club of origin, if you want to call it that, because the bids came before 40. Those were Mitch Edwards, who was a Fremantle Academy player, Lance Collard was West Coast, Luamon Lawal was with the Western Bulldogs, and Togiath with Hawthorne. A couple of other examples also include, uh, off the top of my head, Mac Andrew was a Melbourne Demons NGA that joined the Gold Coast Suns because he went at about pick six or seven or something like that. And uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Cam McKenzie was also a St Kilda NGA uh, as recently as last year, but it joined Hawthorne, of course. But let's consider, you know, the the overall impact that it's had on the AFL draft. So is the talent pool bigger because these academies exist? Well, you'd have to say probably. It's hard to measure exactly how much. So Jed Walter is an example uh, of a player that would likely have become a gun footballer regardless of whether he was part of the Gold Coast Academy. If I'm not mistaken, Jed Walter spent a a bit of his childhood in Perth, grew up as an Eagles fan, um, and yet the Gold Coast, because of their work with him in the academy, have prior access to him. That doesn't seem quite right. But if we're going to give credit where it's due, overall, you'd have to say the impact of these academies is that in theory, there should be a deeper talent pool. I mean, at the same time, we're having shallower drafts than ever. I think that's more due to reduced list sizes than the actual depth of the talent pool. But in theory, we're having, you know, this ally side that came out and won the national championships. That would have been unthinkable 10 years ago. But what clubs don't like about it is while it's a greater overall talent pool, four clubs have access to those players and the other 14 are locked out, in particular the Northern Academies. The other absurd result that was spat out this year was that, um, you know, Gold Coast had four first round selections and they had all four selections before the Wooden Spoon side in West Coast had taken their second pick of the draft. And further to that, it's not as though Gold Coast had a really hard time accumulating those points. They match four first round picks very easily. And you look at next year and they hold two first round picks in their own and the Western Bulldogs as well. I mean, this is fine on the one hand, if you kind of consider Gold Coast have been struggling. So maybe the average fan can turn a blind eye to that a little bit. But when you consider the relative success of someone like a Sydney Swans, who have never really been a struggling side ever, then the outcomes are a little bit odd. Actually, I should point out as well that Riley Sanders did actually qualify as a Next Generation Academy talent as well for North Melbourne after proving that he was Indigenous at some point throughout this year. And therefore, that's technically a fifth player that was missed out in the top 40. Although it must be said, I don't think he was involved with North Melbourne's Academy for quite some time. Now, on the one hand, you know, one of the other outcomes of this situation in the draft where clubs like Gold Coast can trade um, early picks for several later ones and accumulate points is that that does present opportunities for other clubs like the Western Bulldogs in this case to trade up for pick four. And we're going to see Richmond do it next year as well with the amount of later picks they've stockpiled because they know they can trade that for earlier picks from other clubs. I mean, that's good. That creates opportunities as well, but it doesn't really work towards equalization because obviously the Western Bulldogs are, while they miss finals, are not exactly a struggling team. So that's not a mechanism that will actually help uh, some of the lower clubs. Depends on your own viewpoint on that. Now, for the sake of a balanced overview of uh, the impact on the 2023 draft in particular, it wasn't just Northern Academy picks that pushed out the first round to last about 29 picks in the end. We'll have to consider as well, there's two father-son selections in Jordan Croft and Will McCabe. I'm not going to make an argument uh, that the father-son rule, while it works the same in terms of the uh, points matching system, I have no qualms with that personally. I think it's a nice and unique tradition of our game that I quite enjoy. Uh, but there was also a priority pick awarded to the North Melbourne that has to be considered, uh, and two that will impact next year, although they're no longer at North Melbourne. And then of a, a stack of free agency compensation picks, including Ben Mackay, Jade Gresham, and Tom Dade, 
uh, who were in the first round or at the end of the first round that pushed back all of the other clubs too. So some general comments. I mean, this is the first year that I can remember Northern Academy talents being talked about this much because it has produced a pretty absurd result where Gold Coast get four first round picks. Um, and it also it's equally hard to measure to what extent uh, these clubs are really benefiting the game by you know turning some of these more speculative guys who might have chosen other sports or whatever into actual AFL athletes. We don't know how much credit to give respective clubs to that. One thing I will say as a little anecdote as well is that the West Australian Football Commission talent manager, uh, his name is Adam Jones, he had actually made the comment recently that uh, it was amazing how much more physically developed a lot of the allies team were in the national championships because they've been involved with a high level academy in their junior years as well and obviously guys like Jed Walter he does not look like a teenager so that's kind of mapping out you know how what is actually being discussed with regard to the academy system now are there any potential solutions to this i think what we kind of need to do is probably just make it a little bit harder to prevent the outcome of clubs being able to get a huge injection of top end talent uh, simply because certain players were aligned to their academy. So, you know, the first thing I'd probably look at is the 20% discount that clubs get for matching bids. So, so let's say an academy talent is bid on a pick one, uh, that costs 3,000 points. So let's pick Gold Coast in this example randomly, um, randomly, and say they match it with picks 12 and 26, or I don't even know if the points will add up there. They don't actually need to make up the 3,000 points. They get a 20% discount, uh, or as would any club. That is a universal rule, whether it be Father Son or NGAs as well. They just need to get within 20% of that 3,000 mark. And I don't know why that exists because there is no scenario where that discount doesn't apply. So why is it a discount? I would also be looking at bridging the gap between between the benefit that the Northern Academies or the Northern Clubs get and what the other clubs get for their NGAs. Potentially we can have a compromise where NGAs, if they get picked in the first round, can't be matched, but maybe just leave it as the first round. And when I say first round, I mean the after the Premiership team's nominal pick. Obviously they might trade it, but whatever their pick is, which is usually gonna be about 18, that's where we should consider the end of the first round, not adding in four or five you know, priority picks or uh, compensation picks. There has been a, a, a suggestion floated that maybe we make it so that a club needs to match the bid with a pick within the same round, as well as making up the points. I don't necessarily want it to be more complicated for clubs to match bids and, and risk m missing out on their academy player. If that's who they really want, at least give them the opportunity to know exactly what is likely it is going to cost them to be able to match a bid. So for instance, if they have an academy talent that's likely to go end of first round and their first pick is you know the start of the second round, but they technically miss out because the pick comes in one pick before that, I think that would be unfortunate. I would allow clubs to be able to prepare for the draft fairly. I would just make it a little bit more difficult to obtain those points. So another suggestion is potentially just decreasing um, the amount of points that are outside the first round, because if you can match pick one with a bunch of picks in the 20s or whatever, then that becomes a little bit too easy. As for the Northern Academies, um, I believe there is a rule, and I read about this somewhere, but again, this is not like broadcast to the broader community, but I believe there is a restriction on how many academy players the Northern Academies can match in the first round, depending on their ladder position. So if they had finished in the finals Gold Coast, I believe they would have only been able to take two uh, players in their academy in the first round. Maybe they could get tighter on these rules if they do indeed exist. I think I read that on Big Footy, so take that with a pinch of salt. But maybe get tighter so, so that you know you can only match one academy player in each round. That way it still incentivizes uh, clubs investing in these players so that they still get the choice. It improves the overall talent pool as well. And then also further to that, bridging the gap between the advantages the Northern Academies get and what the other clubs get with their next generation academy talents. Because at this point, there's almost no incentive for any of the clubs outside of Queensland and New South Wales to invest in their academies to develop the talent, which is something the AFL wants, obviously. But if they can't match a bid for anything in the top 40, then it really disincentivizes them putting any money into that academy. The thing as well uh, that I talked a little bit about my live stream is that uh, the thing about the draft as a mechanism for getting players onto your list is that uh, I believe that if it went to court, it probably wouldn't be legally enforceable. So for instance, if the Players Association you know, took the AFL to court over the draft system, they could probably win on the grounds of restraint of trade. I was reading an article about this, which I found pretty interesting. Because when you compare it to any other line of work, any other industry, you know, any employee really should have the right to choose who his employer is. In the AFL, that doesn't exist. You sign a contract and you get picked up by whichever club takes you, which is probably not legally enforceable. Thankfully, this has never gone to court, and so our draft system still exists in the way it does. But potentially, 
we are moving towards a future where academies are going to be the way that clubs get talent onto their list, particularly if the AFL really incentivize developing that talent. The obstacles are tough though, because if you have you know two clubs in Queensland, even in West Australia, that divvy up the geography of that particular region, it's gonna produce some unfair results when you consider Melbourne and Victoria divided up by 10 teams. But I just think we might and apparently are getting towards a future where more and more academy players make up the actual draft. So it's gonna be an interesting one to watch. But in the short term, they need to make a little bit more fair between the gap between the Northern Academy's advantages and the Next Generation Academy advantages. But anyway, guys, I hope that video was helpful. Those are general, my, my general thoughts. And obviously as a draft watcher, the, the draft is less fun with a whole stack of um, Academy talents. I'll, I'll leave Father Sons aside because I think that that's a cool rule. But at the same time, we wanna see fairness. And I do accept broadly that there are gonna be benefits to our game. And I have heard that clubs like Gold Coast in particular actually have invested a lot into their, their academy to try and grow talent. It's just a little bit hard to assess from the outside. But anyway, guys, let me know in the comments your thoughts and opinions. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.